just have to say it is uh, so good to see you. It is uh, obviously important conversations going on. The G7 stands uh, strongly in support of you as does Canada, but really good conversations with emerging economies and the global context as well. Uh, lots of good sessions this morning. But I have to say we, we talk every few weeks. But it's so nice to be able to see you in person and so nice to be able to Uh, to be able to actually talk directly like this. So I'm, I'm really happy. I'm very, very happy to see uh, uh, the President Zelensky. Uh, 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 of the conversations are important on the support we have to give and the solidarity of the G7, but also the conversations are interesting and important with the rest of the world. But it's really nice to see my friend in person. Happy to see you. Thank you very much. Thank you, your government, of course, Canadian people for supporting us. Thank you so much. Thank you. Merci tout le monde. Merci It's uh, a real pleasure to be able to sit down with uh, President Lula. Uh, we have a lot in common, whether it's uh, on the environment, it's on the environment, whether it's on uh, indigenous uh, partnerships, uh, whether it's on supporting uh, workers and creating a stronger future for everyone, uh, as well as on global issues, we have lots to talk about. It's a real pleasure to be with you today. It's a great pleasure to be with you today, President Lula, to have the opportunity to talk together on environmental issues, on the peoples of the people, on the economic growth, on the geopolitical issues. Uh, you can speak in Portuguese. <laughs> Não, vou deixar isso para o senhor presidente. Olha, esse encontro com o primeiro-ministro do Canadá, o Brasil é extremamente importante porque nós temos uma relação comercial razoavelmente bem sucedida. Ou seja, nós temos uma relação comercial de praticamente 10 bilhões e meio de dólares. E o que é importante é que não tem vantagem para nenhum país, é mais ou menos igual de importação e importação. E nós achamos que o Brasil tem condições de, junto com o Canadá, sabe, dobrar essa relação comercial. Ao mesmo tempo, interessa ao Brasil conversar com o Canadá a questão do clima. Porque a questão do clima é uma questão que mexe com o mundo inteiro. Tem muita gente falando e pouca gente fazendo o que tem que ser feito, porque ou seja, os acordos muitas vezes não são cumpridos, e essas conversas aqui vai permitindo que a gente vá criando uma corrente de pensamento que possa, numa próxima COP, ter uma decisão que as pessoas cumprem. Ou seja, o mundo não cumpriu o protocolo de Kyoto, o mundo não cumpriu o Acordo de Paris, não cumpriu a COP15, então é preciso que a gente assuma a responsabilidade e que a questão do clima não espera a vontade política nossa. Ela exige que nós sejamos mais rápidos, mais precisos, porque senão quando formos tomar decisões já é tarde demais. Por isso é um prazer estar conversando com o meu amigo Tudor. Before turning the important work we accomplished here at the G7, I uh, want to take a few minutes addressing the budget negotiations that I'm heading back home to, uh, to deal with. Before I left for this trip, I met with all four congressional leaders, and we agreed the only way to move forward was in a bipartisan agreement. 
<clears throat> and we've, I've done my part. We put forward a proposal to cut spending by more than a trillion dollars. And on top of the nearly $3 trillion in deficit reduction that I previously proposed through the combination of spending cuts and new revenues. Now it's time for the other side to move their, from their extreme positions because much of what they've already proposed is simply, uh, quite frankly, unacceptable. And so let me be clear. I'm not going to agree to a deal that protects, for example, a $30 billion tax break for the oil industry, which made $200 billion last year. They don't need an incentive of another $30 billion. While putting health care of 21 million Americans at risk by going after Medicaid. I'm not going to agree to a deal that protects $200 billion in excess payments for pharmaceutical industries and refusing to count that while cutting over 100,000 school teachers and, and, uh, and assistance jobs, 30,000 law enforcement officers, jobs cut across the, the entire uh, United States of America. I'm not going to agree to a deal that protects wealthy tax sheets and crypto traders while putting food assistance at risk for nearly 100, well, I assume nearly 1 million Americans. And it's time for Republicans to accept that there is no bipartisan deal to be made solely, solely on their partisan terms. They have to move as well. All four congressional leaders agree with me that, def that default is not, let me say it again, default is not an option. And I expect each of the I expect each of these leaders, excuse me, <clears throat> to live up to that commitment. America has never defaulted, never defaulted on our debt, and it never will. The speaker and I will be talking later on the plane as we head back because it's what five or six, seven o'clock in the morning there, and our teams are going to continue working. Now, we've had a uh, we've had a packed few days here in Hiroshima and I think with very productive and important meetings at the G7 summit. We also held the Quad meeting here in Hiroshima rather than Australia, and important bilateral discussions with Prime Minister Kashid of Japan, Prime Minister Albanese of Australia, and President Zelensky of Ukraine, as well as the uh, Prime Minister of India. This is my third trip to the Indo-Pacific as President, and I look forward to rescheduling my stops in Papua New Guinea and Australia later. I've spoken with the Prime Minister of Papua New Guinea, and Secretary Blinken is traveling there to meet with the Pacific Island partners at that moment. And I'm also going to be hosting, and I've spoken with the Prime Minister, hosting the leaders of the Pacific Island Forum in Washington this fall, because I've been unable to make it to Papua New Guinea. And uh, Prime Minister Albanese, uh, we're going to have a state visit later this year. And uh, I also want to thank President Kashida for his outstanding — and I'm not — it's not hyperbole — his outstanding leadership of the G7 this year, as well as Mrs. Kashida and the entire Japanese government for the hospitality they've shown to Jill, myself, and our whole team. <clears throat> Being in this city and visiting the memorial on Friday was a powerful reminder of the devastating reality of nuclear war and our shared responsibility to never cease our efforts to build for peace. And together with the leaders of the G7, we have, we have reiterated our commitment to continue to work toward a world free from the threat of nuclear weapons. Over the past few days have uh, showcased the unity, the unity of purpose among the G7. It's a very different organization than it was five, seven, ten years ago, because we're addressing the challenges that matter most to the world. We're united in our efforts to strengthen global health security. And yesterday, I announced that the United States plans to contribute another $250 million to the pandemic fund at the World Bank to make sure the world is better prepared to prevent, detect, and respond to future pandemics. We're united in our commitment to climate action and accelerating the transition to a global clean energy economy by investing in the industries of the future. We're united in our push to build a more resilient and inclusive global economy that can better withstand the kinds of shocks that we've experienced over the last few years, including by building a more secure and more diversified supply chain. Through the Partnership for Global Infrastructure and Investment, which we launched last year at the G7 summit in Germany, <laughs> we've addressed the infrastructure needs that are holding back too many low- and moderate-income countries, particularly in the Global South. 
The United States has already mobilized more than $30 billion in PGII projects around the globe, a significant step toward our, our collective pledge of the G7 to mobilize $600 billion in investment by 2027. And we resolved to reform the multilateral development banks to give them more flexibility and better able to fight poverty by helping respond to global challenges. Now, we're also united in our approach to the People's Republic of China. And the joint statement we released yesterday outlines the shared principles we've all agreed at the G7 and beyond in dealing with China. We're not looking to decouple from China. We're looking to de-risk and diversify our relationship with China. That means taking steps to diversify our supply chains, and we're not, so we're not dependent on any one country for necessary product. It means resisting economic coercion together and countering harmful practices that hurt our workers. It means protecting a narrow set of advanced technologies critical for our national security. And those elements are all agreed on by the G7. Finally, joined here in Hiroshima by President Zelensky, and the G7 reaffirmed our shared and unwavering, let me say it again, our shared and unwavering commitment to stand with the brave people of Ukraine as they defend themselves against Russia's brutal war of aggression and the war crimes being committed. Together with our partner countries, we reiterated the need for a just peace that respects Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity, both core principles of the UN Charter. Russia started this war. And Russia could end it today by withdrawing its troops from Ukraine, internationally recognized borders, and ceasing its assault. Until then, excuse me, the ability, Ukraine's ability to defend itself <clears throat> is essential to being able to end this war permanently and through diplomacy. You know, and this morning, I once more shared and assured President Zelensky, together with all G7 members and our allies and partners around the world, that we will not waver. Putin will not break our resolve as he thought he could two years ago, almost three years ago. We're going to continue to provide economic, humanitarian, and security assistance to Ukraine so it can stand strong as long as it needs it. And today, the United States announced our latest tranche of artillery, ammunition, anti-tank weapons, and bridging equipment to help Ukraine succeed in the battlefield. You know, in my private meeting with President Zelensky after the G7 meeting, and with his staff, I told him the United States, together with our allies and partners, is going to begin training Ukrainian pilots in fourth-generation fighter aircraft, including F-16s, to strengthen Ukraine's Air Force as part of a long-term commitment to Ukraine's ability to defend itself. We provided the last year all that they needed to deal with what they were dealing with at the moment. And that's when and now we're moving in the direction of putting them in a position to be able to be defend themselves in ways beyond what they've had to deal with so far. The past few days have once more underscored how important America's global leadership is. Presumptuous thing for American President to say, but I think you'll find if you ask any of our colleagues, it's true. The security and prosperity of the American people are substantially increased by working in concert with our closest allies and partners to build a future of greater economic strength and resilience in a world that is more peaceful and stable. And on many of these issues that matter to the American people, accelerating our clean energy transition, preventing another pandemic, dealing with China, standing up for Ukraine, the meetings I've had with my fellow G7 leaders have left us more united, more resolved, and more determined to set up for the greater progress in the months ahead. And this has been an extremely significant and important summit. With that, uh, I'm going to take some questions. And uh, uh, Trevor uh, of Reuters. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, you spoke a moment ago about what you won't do in terms of your negotiations with Republicans, but I'm interested in what you've signaled you already might do. Um, uh, in particular, uh, by conceding in these negotiations to some form of a cap or freezing spending, uh, are you concerned that Mr. McCarthy has already forced you into accepting a policy position that could tip this economy into a recession? No, uh, I don't believe that's the case at all. As a matter of fact, uh, 
I think that uh, we can reach an agreement. As I've told you, and you may be aware you've seen it, we have provided for a proposal that would cut a trillion dollars off the baseline spent from the year before by just agreeing to deal with what was initially offered. And uh, secondly, we're in a situation where um, the — let me put it this way. If you all were doing your budget at home and you said, OK, we have to make some cuts, would you only look at the spending? Or would you also look at your income, what was coming in the door to determine what you could afford? And so part of what I've been arguing from the beginning is a need to consider the tax structure as well as — as well as cutting spending. I'm willing to cut spending, and I propose cuts in spending of over a trillion dollars. But I believe we have to also look at the tax revenues. The idea that the — my Republican colleagues want to continue the $2 trillion tax cut that had profound negative impacts on the economy from the Trump administration. The fact that they are — we've provided for the number — we got a lot of uh, input from serious economists and former administration officials in both parties — that we need more people who are qualified to be able to look at the tax returns of the thousand billionaires in America. Very complicated stuff. It's estimated that if we had the appropriate number of tax — tax personnel, that we would save somewhere between — we would gen generate some, somewhere between uh, $200 billion and $400 billion in tax revenue. And there's a lot of other — for example, the idea that we're uh, — in terms of uh, taxes that they refuse to — for example, we uh, — I was able to balance the budget and pass everything from the, the global warming bill. Anyway, I was able to — cut by $1.7 billion in the first two years, the deficit that we uh, were — were accumulating. And uh, because I was able to say to it that the 55 corporations in America that made $40 $400 billion — or $40 billion — $400 billion — that uh, they uh, — they had paid zero in tax. Zero. And so we said, you got to pay a minimum of 15 percent taxes. What a horrible thing. You're paying more than 15 percent in taxes, every one of you out there. And so guess what? We not only balanced the budget, we, we were able to reduce the deficit by $1.7 billion. And so there's a lot of things that they refuse to look at in terms of tax generation, as well as what kind of people we're going to increase taxes for. And like I said, we're now down to — we went from — some, uh, roughly 740 billionaires to a, uh, about 1,000 billionaires in America. They're paying an average tax rate of 8 percent. Raise your hand if you want to pay 8 percent only. I think you'd all be ready to do that. So my point is that there's a lot of things that they refuse to entertain, and they just said revenue is off the table. Well, revenue is not off the table. And so that's what I conti we continue to have a significant disagreement on, on the revenue side. But you don't think the spending cuts themselves will cause recession? I know they won't. I know they won't. Matter of fact, uh, uh, the fact that we were able to uh, uh, cut uh, government spending by $1.7 trillion, that didn't cause a recession. That caused growth. Look, we have uh, the lowest unemployment rate in over 50 years. We've created 12 point — I think it's 7 million new jobs, including 800,000 manufacturing jobs. We have moved in a direction where we're rebuilding and reconstructing America through the — through the, the Infrastructure Act. Look, here's the other thing. I'm sure — I'm not sure. My guess is I'll get a question about, you know, well, wait a minute, you know, the American people aren't satisfied. Well, guess what? As I told you all before, most of this, what we've passed, doesn't kick in — it only kicks in over time. And so the fact is, for example, that if you're in a situation where you were — I'll give you the one example that I've used, everybody understands the easiest — is insulin. Well, I decided that we were going to be in a position where 
we were not going to continue to pay the highest drug prices in the world. <clears throat> and that's what we do, by the way. Same manufacturer of a drug in the United States, selling it here in Japan, selling it in Tokyo, or selling it in Berlin, or selling it around the world, they pay a lot less than we pay at home. So we said a simple proposition. Let's take a look at how much it costs to make the product. And I'm not going to ask you to show of hands like I do in a town meeting, but if I usually ask how many people know somebody who has type 1 or type 2 diabetes, and almost at least half the audience raises their hand. Well, they were paying somewhere between four and $700 a month for their insulin that they badly need to stay healthy and alive. Well, guess what? It costs $10, T-E-N, $10 to make, to package total amount, you could argue maybe as much as $13. Well, guess what? Now they can't charge more for Medicare can't because Medicare is paying, taking American tax dollars and paying for the elderly's health care needs. You can't charge more than $35 for that, that drug. That saved $160 billion. Hear it? $160 billion less will be paid out by, by the American taxpayer to help the elderly people on Medicare with a problem. Well, a lot of this is just kicking in. We're in a situation where next year, for the drug cost, no senior will have to pay total cost, total cost of all the drugs, from expensive cancer drugs to whatever drug they're taking, will not have to pay more than $3,500 a year. The following year, we've already passed this, this is the law now. The following year, they won't have to pay more than $2,000. That saves another $200 billion that we're paying out. But the other team won't count this. Even though it's the law, we passed it, they won't count that as reducing the debt. So there's a lot of those kinds of disagreements we have. And uh, my guess is that uh, um, I'm going to be talking to, uh, to uh, the Speaker of the House on the way back on the plane because there'll be morning time over at home, and I'm going to be in that plane in about an hour or so. And uh, my guess is he's going to want to deal directly with me and making sure we're all on the same page. But that's probably more than you wanted to know. Um, how about uh, uh, Macero, uh, NHK? Hi. Good evening, Mr. President. Uh, the Chinese military is more active at this time in the Taiwan Strait with uh, expectations this might increase uh, leading up to Taiwan's presidential election next January. Despite, uh, despite uh, some you know, di diplomatic uh, communication recently between the U.S. and China, the military hotline is not working. Under these circumstances, uh, how will you manage the diplomatic you know, relationship with China, and how will you strengthen the U.S. alliance with Japan and ROK in order to counter China? Thank you. Well, uh, now, number one, you're right. We should have an open hotline. At the Bali conference, that's what the President Xi and I agreed we were going to do and meet on. And then this silly balloon that was carrying two freight cars worth of its fine equipment was flying over the United States, and it got shot down, and uh, everything changed um, in terms of talking to one another. I think you're going to see that begin to thaw very shortly. But in the meantime, what's happened is, I think it's fair to say, for those of you who have uh, dealt with, uh, dealt with uh, the Japanese government and reported from here for a long time, uh, the situation in terms of our relations with Japan have never, ever, ever in American history been stronger. Never. Never. And we started this relationship when I came to see some of you were with me on my first trip here, when I came to see President, the, the, President Kishida's predecessor, and made the case that what's happening in Europe, which is small, the world's getting smaller. What's happening in Europe and the invasion of Ukraine is affects everyone, including people here in the Pacific Basin. And so we've ended up where you have Japan stepping up in a way that's of real consequence in terms of your defense budget, number one, and uh, a beginning of a rapprochement with South Korea. I've spoken at length with President Loon of South Korea. He came to Washington of late. 
He's agreed, we're all of the same agreement, that in fact we are not going to, we're maintaining, we all agree we're going to maintain the one China policy, which says everybody kind of forgets. Now, I mean, you all know, but the public kind of forgets that it says that neither country, Japan, I mean, China or Taiwan, neither er territory can independently declare what they're going to do, period. There has to be a mutually agreed to out outcome. And so what we're, we're sticking by that. We're not going to tell China what they can do. We made it, we made it clear that we don't expect we don't expect Taiwan to independently declare independence either. But in the meantime, we're going to continue to put Taiwan in a position that they can defend themselves. And there is clear understanding among most of our allies that, in fact, if China were to act unilaterally, there would be a response. There would be a response. But I, so I don't think there's anything inevitable about the notion that there's going to be this conflict between the United States and the West and or Japan and Korea and uh, the Quad. And if you take a look at what's happened, we are more secure with all the talk about China's building its military. It is building its military. And that's why I've made it clear that uh, I am not going to prepare, I'm not prepared to trade certain items with China. And when I was asked by President Xi why, I said, because you're using them to build nuclear weapons and other weapons of mass destruction, and I'm not going to do it. And we've now got commitment from all of our allies, they're not going to either provide that kind of material that allows them to do that. But that's not a hostile act, that's an act that says we're going to make sure that we do everything we can to maintain the status quo ante. And what's going on now is, the, look, look at the meeting we had here today, uh, uh, today and yesterday, of the Quad. Did, I, I bet you, I would, maybe some of you thought it, but I doubt many, many, many people in this audience or any other audience would have said that two years after being elected, I'd be able to convince India, Australia, Japan, and the United States to form an organization called the Quad to maintain stability in the Indian Ocean and the South China Sea. Well, when asked by the Prime Minister, by uh, uh, President Xi why we're doing that, I said, simple. We have an international organization that have agreed upon what constitutes open air space and sea space. And we're not going to allow that to be unilaterally altered, period. We're not changing any rules. We're just making sure that we unite democracies in the con con conviction that the Pacific Basin remains what it was before, open and clear. So I guess what I'm saying is, I don't guess what I'm saying, what I'm trying to say is I think we're more united than we've ever been, ever been in the Pacific in terms of maintaining stability and, and uh, um, maintaining a sense of security. So uh, I'm not sure that answers your question, but I hope it does. If it doesn't, do you want to follow up with any portion of that question? Well, how about, uh, if you don't want to follow, how about Anne Maria Bloomberg, TV and radio? Thank you, Mr. President. You just said, I'm willing to cut spending. Speaker McCarthy says that the U.S. government needs to spend less next year than they did this year. So will you agree to that? And on China, your team has been trying to secure meetings with their Chinese counterparts. Would you consider easing some sanctions to improve relations, like the sanctions that are currently on China's defense minister? Thank you. Yes and no. No, I'm not going to ease the sanctions. But yes, I think we should. Uh, on the front end of your question is that we, there's a lot that is going on relative to spending. And we have agreed to cut spending. We've cut spending and we're going to continue to cut spending. But the question is what base do you start from? Initially, if you remember when the Republicans introduced their, when the speaker, uh, by I guess a four or five vote majority, was able to pass his, what he calls, extending the debt with a limitation on how, what you had to do to expend it in terms of the budget side. I said, I'm not going to negotiate on whether you extend the debt. I will negotiate on the budget. On the budget side of the equation, they came along and said, initially, it's hard to determine where they are, quite frankly. And I don't know, you all may know more from questioning them than I do. 
but they came along and said, we're going to move off of the 2023 budget. And that's the baseline we're going to use for the next two years, that, that budget. And I said, well, what about what you all just voted on after the budget, which was the add-on money that you, you all agreed to on the House and Senate voted for? And they said, well, that includes that as well. I said, okay, well, then we may be able to work on something. So we started calculating what that would mean in terms of a t it came to a 22 percent cut for everything in the budget but the things that have already been passed the five big initiatives that i've already passed in terms of infrastructure the the affordable care act etc et but in the meantime what happened is that uh, that seems to be changing they said well we're going to exempt remember we said that, well, you're going to cut veterans because 20 said everything, that's discretionary budget. So, no, we're not going to cut veterans. Okay, that's good. And we initially they started off, they're going to cut Medicare and Medicaid. They said, whoa, 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 no, I mean, not Medicaid, Social Security and Medicare. They said, no, 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 no. First time I ever had a negotiation in the State of the Union message. Uh, but they said, no, we're not going to cut that. Okay, well, that's off, off, off the r r radar. What else is off the radar? And they named some other things. And I said, well, that means if you want to get the number you wanted from freezing the budget at 2023 plus the additions you added, then that means you're going to go from 22 percent, you're going to end up cutting 30 percent or 35 percent discretionary budget. For example, if you calculate what they're talking about, you're going to lose, they're going to lose 100,000 teachers and assistants. They're going to lose thousands of police officers across the board. I mean, just calculate what it means if you take all discretionary spending and you make no distinctions other than what the percentage number of the cut is. And some of it makes absolutely no sense at all. And so what we've done is we're going to have to sit down. I'm hoping that, uh, that uh, Speaker McCarthy is just waiting to negotiate with me when I get home, which has been, I don't know whether that's true or not. We'll find out. But at first, we weren't making progress. Then we made a lot of progress. And then all of a sudden, they came back with a proposal that was very cut back from where they had agreed or discussed. And uh, now, I don't know where we, we gave a counter proposal to the counter again. I know this sounds ridiculous, but that's what we did. And I'm waiting to hear the response to what we have offered. We are willing to cut spending as well as raise revenue so people start paying their fair share. Again, if this is for a town meeting to ask, raise your hand if you think the tax structure is fair, remotely fair. What do you think? Anyway, so that's the context. No, I know that. That's under negotiation right now. I thought you said whether I would lift sanctions on material I was going to send, sell the Defense Department, meaning would I sell some? The answer, that's under discussion. Um, Jim Tankersley, New York Times. Hi, Mr. President, thank you. Oh. Um, you speak a lot at these summits about the power of democracies to solve big problems. Uh, but I'm curious, in these meetings with world leaders, how are you explaining the possibility that American democracy could cause a global financial crisis uh, if the debt limit is breached uh, next month. And I'm wondering if you are offering them assurances that whether it's by invoking the 14th Amendment or anything else, you will take whatever steps you need to make sure that doesn't happen. First of all, um, it would be a very serious circumstance if we didn't pay our debt for the first time in 230 years. That'd be a serious problem. So far, there's been very little discussion, and they all know what's going on, about whether or not we're going to default on our debt, number, no, number two. Number three, I can't guarantee that they wouldn't force a default by doing something outrageous. I can't guarantee that. Number four. I'm looking at the 14th Amendment as whether or not we have the authority. I think we have the authority. The question is, could it be done and invoked in time that it could not, would not be appealed and, as a consequence, past the date in question and still to fall on the debt? 
that's a question that I think is unresolved. And so the point is, I think, I'm hoping, and I believe that when we stood in that, when we sat in the room with all the leaders from Mitch McConnell on, uh, and they said, we will not default, period. We will not default. That's what all, including Kevin McCarthy said, we will not default. And so I'm assuming that we mean what we say and we'll figure out a way to not have to default. Um, Elizabeth Palmer, CBS News. Good afternoon, hey. Mr. President. Um, what has President Zelensky told you about the big counteroffensive? And maybe you can start by telling us whether it's actually underway or not. And also, I'd like to ask you about the F-16s. You've greenlit them now. Uh, Jake Sullivan said arms and equipment go to Ukraine uh, according to what he called the exigencies of the conflict. So what exigency now exists that didn't exist, that demands these planes? Well, I'll tell you exactly when they're going to move, exactly where they're going to go. He told me, <laughs> come on, <laughs> God love you. I'm going to, even if I knew precisely, you think I'm going to tell you what they're going to do in terms of their offensive? Well, I hope you hope I wouldn't do that because that would mean it wouldn't succeed. But the fact is that um, we did discuss privately uh, with, uh, with Zelensky, I did discuss with Zelensky how, let me put it this way. We and our NATO allies know how many brigades they have trained, know what the status of those brigades are, and have an expectation as to what their likelihood of succeeding are. We don't know that for certain. War is uncertain. War is uncertain, not to state the obvious. So, and my, uh, it will proceed. I can't, if, even if I, I think I do know, but I'm not gonna tell you because that would not be a smart thing to do either. <clears throat> so having said that, uh, the expectation and hope is that they will be successful in that it'll make it clear to Russia that the cost, for, for example, Bakhmut. Bakhmut is a, a discussion about whether or not it's been lost or whatever. And well, the truth of the matter is, the Russians have suffered over 100,000 casualties in Bakhmut. It's hard to make up. It's hard to make up. So whether or not there is, there are troops in Bakhmut occupying, there's not many buildings left standing in Bakhmut. It's a pretty devastated city but they have been able to move in a direction that they've been able to lock down an awful lot of the Russian forces, including the Wagner group. So with regard to the F-16s, F-16s would not have helped in that regard at all. It was unnecessary, for example, let's take just Bakhmut, for example, would not have any, any additional added consequence. But what's happened is since the, provi the provision of everything from the uh, significant missile defense systems, uh, tanks, sophisticated tanks and the like, all the things that were of consequence in the near term in the Dumbass area and where the f fighting was taking place, they now have all that equipment. There's a little bit still coming, but have all that equipment. What's gonna happen though is if they continue to do well, they're gonna be in a situation where you're gonna have the Russians being able to stand off at a greater distance from maintaining their headquarters and other things which are out of range of certain of the existing capacity they have. And they have to be able to be in a position where now those fighter jets, those F-16s, make a big difference in terms of being able to deal with what is coming down the road and God willing, and we don't know this, if they're successful and there ends up being an accommodation where there is not a ceasefire, but there is a peace agreement that gets worked out, that they'll have the capacity to have confidence in their ability to resist response by the Russians if they were to change their position. So that's the essence of the difference. Was there another part of the question? No, 
not the percent. I, I don't expect the F-16s to take part in the existing. Let, let's assume that uh, it's not. But let's assume tomorrow the offensive was started, or in a week, or two, or five, or seven, or ten. It's not highly unlikely they would take place in that context. But it will take place in the context if they're successful in the near term. They're going to then continue to have to fight with the Russians who have, have headquarters beyond where they are now a, not able to reach by the existing capacity that exists in their arsenal. So it's a different need, just like the tanks weren't needed in the beginning, but they're needed now. And so that's, that's the nature of the change. <laughs> I have a flat assurance from the from Zelensky that they will not they will not use it to go on and move into Russian geographic territory. But wherever Russian troops are within Ukraine in the area, they would be able to do that. Thank you all very, very much. Appreciate it.